Good morning. Welcome to this simulated live worship service. We are glad that you are here, and we hope that you'll be blessed by the singing, by the prayers, by the reading of Scripture, and the reading and preaching of God's Word. We're glad that you have joined us today. I do want to say that we are planning next Sunday to gather again physically here at the church. You should have received this week an email with some guidelines that we have been working through. Now, I also want to say that as the week goes along, if uh, new data comes out or we feel like we need to make some adjustments on those guidelines or, or anything like that, we'll make those adjustments and we will communicate with you about those. I also want to say that if you're not ready to gather again physically, you're encouraged to stay home we are going to continue to broadcast this on our YouTube channel. Uh, we, we encourage that. If you're feeling that way and not, not yet ready, we encourage that. We affirm your decision. You are loved by the church at Tubac. And uh, especially if, if you are feel like your immune system is compromised or it might be danger for you to gather, we want you to stay home. Uh, but we are going to try to gather. That is the plan for now. Uh, with, with the idea that if we need to make adjustments this week, we will do that. But we're here today, and we are looking forward to what God has for us during this service. Can I pray for you as we get started? Father, we thank you for this time. Father, pour out your Spirit on us during this service. Father, we pray that you would bless us through all the different components of this morning and our time together and we pray, Lord, that you would encourage us through the word of God. We pray, Lord, that your name would be lifted up, that Jesus Christ would be glorified. We pray for people to be saved. And we pray, Lord, for you to encourage your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. This is Kevin and Loretta. Kevin will be reading from Acts 9, 32 through 35. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Psalm 111. 
Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in them. All that he does is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has provided food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the inheritance of nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his instructions are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in truth and in uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. His name is holy and awe-inspiring. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever.
I want to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 5. In just a few minutes, we're going to look at verses 12 through 16. When you go to Walmart and someone in that first parking spot pulls out just as you're driving down the aisle and you get that prime parking spot, do you cry out, it's a miracle? Well, that's fortunate, but it's not a miracle. Say a month ago, you were down to your last squares of toilet paper. You'd scoured the stores for weeks without being able to find any. Finally, you went to Costco, go down the toilet paper aisle and wrap your arms around that last package of toilet paper and with tears in your eyes, exclaim, it's a miracle. Well, again, that's great but it's not a miracle. In the modern church, we can often see two different extremes in terms of miracles. Some churches have such an obsession with miracles that they talk about them to the exclusion of talking about the gospel enough. On the flip side, some churches hardly mention miracles. And so today we're gonna look at a passage that emphasizes miracles and we ask ourselves, what should the church today believe about miracles? And the theme of our sermon is God uses miracles to confirm the truth of the gospel and bring glory to himself. Let's read together Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's colonnade. No one, dared to join, no one else dared to join them, but the people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. In addition, a multitude came together from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's pray. Father, take your word and use it in our lives, we pray. We ask that you will help us to preach and hear your word in such a way as we understand it and can rightly apply it to our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Well, if the scenes in Acts 5 were clips on YouTube, they would be striking videos. Everything is going well inside the church, for the most part, at the end of chapter 4. But in the beginning of chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira drop dead due to God's judgment on their sin. Now that's a vivid picture that will wake up a church. Then we see these incredible scenes in the verses that I just read to you, where God performed miracles and people were saved. The people started taking sick friends and family members in their beds to the streets so that they would be healed. Word spread even outside the city of Jerusalem so that a multitude from surrounding areas also brought their sick and demon-possessed to Jerusalem to be healed. So, I mean, this is, this is quite an image in our minds. Imagine if this had happened in Tucson, and people from Saurita and Tubac and Rio Rico were taking sick people and seeing them healed. So don't just think of this as words on paper. This really happened. These were events in history, and people were fascinated. It brought a lot of attention. But as we continue looking in Acts chapter 5, it also brings about a lot of opposition. The high priest and the Sanhedrin put the apostles on trial once again. Now you recall this just happened at the end of Acts chapter 4. But this time, whereas in chapter 4 they had let them off with a warning, this time they wanted to kill them. But after a speech by Gamaliel, they backed off and settled on just flogging them. 
But that's not the end of the persecution. In Acts chapter 6, Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin, and his trial ends with him becoming the first Christian martyr. The church is scattered, and the gospel goes to the world. So we see incredible scenes found within this text. So today, as we narrow in on verses, our narrow focus down in verses 12 through 16, this segment fits within that overall storyline. So in this text that we're focusing on today, we say great miracles taking place. Some scholars count 13 types of miracles that take place in the book of Acts. Now, the miracles that take place here in Acts chapter 5 remind us of miracles that took place during Jesus' ministry. Hear this from Mark chapter 6, verses 54 and following. As they got out of the boat, people immediately recognized him. They hurried throughout that region and began to carry the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, into villages, towns, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch just the end of his robe, and everyone who touched it was healed. So you see some similarities there as we go to Acts chapter 5. People were being healed. They were being carried on mats to be healed. So when we go back to chapter 4, the Sanhedrin had released Peter and John. And they had done so with the order not to preach Jesus anymore. And of course, Peter said we have to obey God rather than men. So they go back to the church and they began to pray for boldness. Now I want you to hear the conclusion of that prayer in verses 29 through 30 of chapter 4. Here's what it says. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when we preached that passage, we didn't focus too much on this part of the prayer. But now that we come to verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, we should see that the signs and wonders that are being performed there are an answer to this very specific prayer in Acts chapter 4. They prayed for God to stretch out His hand for healing, signs, and wonders. And that's exactly what we see in chapter 5. Great healing, deliverance was taking place in this chapter. And the people are fascinated by miracles. That term wonders means that people were astonished by the miracles that they had witnessed. But the miracles are not the main point. They serve the gospel. See, the prayer in chapter 4 shows them praying that God's miraculous work takes place while they are speaking God's word with all boldness. So we don't want to sever the miracles from the gospel that the miracles are confirming. You see that, grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed. So that while that connects the signs, the wonders, the miracles with the gospel that is being proclaimed. And it's meant to confirm and bring people to saving faith. So I'm thankful, very thankful for the events that take place in Acts 5, verse 12, verses 15, verse 16. I'm thrilled that God healed and delivered people from satanic oppression. It's glorious. And we don't want to skip past it. We want to be grateful for it. But I also want to say that every one of those people would die later. At some point, their earthly lives would end not in healing, but in death. And the question then is, what then? What happens to them then? And on that day, the most important thing in their lives is their relationship to Jesus. So what's primary, I think, in these verses that we read is verse 14. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. 
So the miracles confirmed the truth of the message and people were trusting in Jesus. They were getting saved. Their eternity was being secured. Notice Luke's terminology. He calls the miracles signs. Signs point to something. We're not to be so obsessed with signs that we miss what they're pointing to. Have you ever been driving in your car and you get to, uh, you, you've missed some gas stations along the way, or maybe you've been waiting for one and you realize you're on the last fumes of gas in your car and you're getting nervous and you're searching for a gas station. Then you see up ahead somewhere, there's a sign for Circle K. Now, you don't stop and get out of your car at the sign and hug the sign and be real grateful to the sign. No, you go to what the sign is pointing to. You go to the gas station and get gas in your car. So here's what's going on. God gave these signs of healing that are glorious and amazing and show his power. But they also point to the truthfulness of the message that the apostles are proclaiming. Those who put their trust in Jesus' completed work on the cross will be saved. Witnessing a miracle doesn't save someone. Believing the gospel is what saves. So what is that gospel? Here it is. Jesus lived a perfect life. But he went to the cross to die, not for his sins because he had none. He went to die for our sins. He went to take our punishment. He went to bear God's wrath against our sin. And he died there paying the full debt for us. God raised him from the dead, vindicating all his work. Jesus is alive forevermore. And if we place our faith completely in Jesus, coming to him in faith and repentance, we will be saved. So what we see here in this text is the miracle show God's power, confirm the truth of the message the disciples preach, people believe and are saved. Now we've seen that with the healing of the man who had been lame from birth in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. He was healed miraculously. The crowd gathered. Peter preached a sermon and 2,000 people got saved. The miracle served the message. And so that's exactly what, when we come to chapter 5, people were fascinated by the miracles, but then they also believed the gospel that had been proclaimed. So now let me try to clear up what looks like, it's not, but what looks like a contradiction between verses 13 and 14 in our text today. Verse 13 says, no one else dared to join them. But then verse 14 says, Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. So how can both of those things be true at the same time? How can no one else dare to join, but also multitudes of people join? Well, here's the context. The people of Jerusalem were fascinated by the power that was evident among the church. And that power was evident in healing but also in judgment. Remember where we are in this storyline here. This is right after Ananias and Sapphira had tried to deceive the church, had lied to the Holy Spirit, and God judged their sin by striking them dead. No doubt that story spread quickly around Jerusalem. So it seems here as we get to chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, that people are attracted to the miracles, but they recognize that this God who has healed also has the right to judge. And it could be dangerous to approach God with anything but undivided devotion. So you see here, they're social distancing. They're staying away there in verse 13. But the people in verse 14 are those who are willing to completely surrender to God by their faith in Jesus. They're willing to join with complete devotion. So I think the way that we want to understand verse 13's no one daring to join means those who are just fascinated by the miracles, 
but don't yet believe the word no better than to join flippantly. They're not going to join just casually. Instead, those of verse 14 who put their faith in Jesus have surrendered to his lordship and they're all in. They, they are completely devoted to him. For them, the signs and wonders have had the proper effect in confirming the gospel and people got saved. So, we in the church, we who believe in the authority, the inerrancy, the infallibility, the inspiration of God's word, we believe the miracles we read about in the gospels and acts really did happen. They're not just stories that were made up. They actually happened. The world often doesn't believe in miracles ever since the time of the Enlightenment. So many people have rejected belief in miracles. But it's impossible to be a Christian if we reject miracles. Our faith is founded on the miracle of Jesus' resurrection. But we are a people who believe the Bible. The Bible is full of miracles. And we believe that each and every one of those miracles recorded in Scripture actually happened. But what about today? What are we to believe about miracles in our day and age? Do miracles still occur today? Or was this a special time in history meant to confirm the work of the apostles and of miracles now stopped. Now, this is territory that we want to navigate carefully. When you walk through the desert and you walk by Choya cactus, you don't just run through a Choya cactus field carelessly. You, you are careful about where you step and, and how you walk through that field. Well, I want to be precise with my words today so I'm not misunderstood. This is an area that can cause division. I don't want that to happen for us. So I want to say clearly that I don't believe miracles have stopped. Okay, I believe God still does miracles. But I also don't believe we should schedule a a healing night on our calendar at our church and demand that God heal every sick person that we've ever heard of. Is there a place for miracles today? Yes, I believe so. Did miracles stop with the apostles? No, I don't believe so. Are miracles going to happen at the same frequency today as they did in the early church with the apostles? No, probably not. Should we still pray for miracles? Yes, I believe we should. I don't believe God meant to leave his church powerless in this world. So let me give you a definition of a miracle here. Here is Wayne Grudem's definition. He says, a miracle is a less common kind of God's activity in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. Now, we've already said that in the lives of the apostles, the miracles confirm the truth of the gospel message. Now, there are some people who believe that miracles were limited to only the time of the apostles. And now that the apostles are gone, now that we have God's written word, Maybe we shouldn't expect miracles today. That's the argument of some. I want to quote some comments to you from John Piper. I really appreciate the ministry of John Piper. You've heard me quote him often. I'm going to quote some lengthy comments because I really appreciate what he said and think he says it well, and I think it would be a benefit to us. So here's what he says. Should we be expecting the same miraculous confirmations of our witnessing today? My answer is yes but not in the same measure that the apostles experienced this miraculous power. The reason I say yes is that I don't see any compelling reason given in the New Testament that God has declared a moratorium on miracles. He goes on. So I think God intends to bless his word and his people with miracles in our day, extraordinary works of divine power that go beyond the laws of nature. But the reason I say probably not in the same measure that the apostles experienced this miraculous power is that there is good evidence that miracles were especially, were especially prominent in the early days to vindicate the deity of Christ and the authority of the apostles as they laid the foundation of the church. He continues, So when the Lord Jesus returns to heaven and the apostles have laid the foundation 
of the church in the New Testament and are taken off the scene, I think what we have is not a de-supernaturalized religion, not at all. The Holy Spirit has been poured out and he is still fully capable of doing signs and wonders. Rather, we have a centralized focus on the word of God, the gospel, because all the central acts of salvation are now in history. And it is the word that connects us with these these saving acts of God in the past. End of quote. So thinking through that, how do we apply this to the church today? If we believe miracles still occur. So how do we apply that? Well, I think there must be a balance between never praying for miracles on the one side and then on the other side, selling handkerchiefs on our website and promising that if you buy one, a miracle will take place. I think those are two extremes that we want to avoid. There should be a balance there because when we get to those extremes, we get into error. Some people believe that it is never God's will for a believer to be sick. They believe that God is always obligated to heal. That is a wrong idea about miracles. But we can so recoil from that bad theology that we never pray big prayers asking God to intervene in miraculous ways. I believe we can both ask God big things, but also submit to his sovereign will to act as he knows is best in each situation. So I think we should pray for medical procedures, for surgeries, for doctors, for nurses. I believe we can also pray for God's more direct and miraculous intervention. So can we pray that prayer from Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 30? I believe, yes, we can pray that prayer, not in a way that orders God around, not in a way that dictates to God how he must act, not in a way that demands things of God, but in a way that surrenders to God's sovereign will in each and every situation. So, I want to give some cautions about miracles. And as I give those also, hopefully give some truth in there about miracles. And I really believe that our motivations for miracles are crucial. I believe that we need to have the right motivation. And the motivation is the glory of God. The motivation should be about God being glorified in this world and people being saved and people loving Jesus more. So here's one caution. Miracles shouldn't be about any person's fame or fortune. Miracles should point people to Jesus, not man. We see in Acts chapter 8, here in a few chapters, there's a a guy named Simon. Let me just read verses 18 and following to you. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter told him, May your silver be destroyed with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Simon's motivation in this account doesn't seem to be the glory of God, the spread of the gospel of Jesus. Simon doesn't seem to want Jesus' name exalted here. Simon seems to want Simon's name exalted here. Those so-called faith healers that have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank seem to be more about their own fame and fortune than God's glory. Our desire must be that people experience the riches of God's grace in Christ, not to increase the riches of man. The motivation for miracles is the glory of God, not the glory of mankind. I don't understand why if those faith healers truly have that power to heal and are impervious to sickness, 
Why in these last two months were they standing behind pulpits and not inside the hospitals in New York City bringing about healing? No, our, our motivation should be about the glory of God. So that's one caution. Another caution is seeking signs because you want to see a trick, not experiencing transformation. You remember before Jesus goes to the cross, he was sent to Herod. And in Luke 23, we see the account of Herod. He had wanted to see Jesus, not because he wanted to believe, not because he wanted his life transformed. Herod wanted to be entertained. Here's what it says, verses 8 and 9. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. Jesus wouldn't even speak to him, much less perform a miracle. Why? Because Herod was not looking for reasons to put his faith in Jesus. All he wanted to do was see a trick. So our desire for miracles should be a display of God's power to bring about faith in Jesus. See, these are working hand in hand in so many of the texts that we see. But the word of God, the proclamation of the gospel is central. If words or the word and signs and wonders were Academy Awards, the word of the gospel would be the lead actor. The signs and wonders would be the supporting actor. These signs are pointing to the truth of the message. See, we even get a warning from Jesus as he speaks to the scribes and the Pharisees. They come to him in Matthew 12 and they ask him or say to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, those are hard words. Why? Because they weren't looking to believe. They had hardened their hearts. Jesus doesn't give them a miracle because they were not desiring to believe. But we do see times when belief comes as a direct result of God working these miracles. Listen to Acts chapter 9, verses 40 and following. Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, prayed, and turning toward the body, said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. He called the saints and widows and presented her alive. Great miracle. Great miracle had taken place in Tabitha. Then here, verse 42. This became known throughout Joppa. What became known? The miracle. And many believed in the Lord. Do you see that? Do you see how the miracle happens? People got saved. This wasn't a trick that was just performed for the fun of it. It's a sign that went forward and it was told and people believed the gospel. So it was confirming the truth of the gospel. So caution, miracles shouldn't be about any person's fame and fortune. Caution, don't seek these signs as a trick, but for transformation. And then thirdly, there's a caution about false miracles as wicked deception. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 through 10, Paul wrote, The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders serving the lie, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. And we see here, Again, we've said people are fascinated by miracles. They're drawn to them. Yet we also see here in the last day that Satan is working through this lawless one, signs and wonders. So how do we discern between these signs and wonders of Satan and lawless one? And, and you see this even further in Revelation with the beast. How do we discern those from like what we hope uh, to see in God answering prayers and God doing signs and wonders. Here's how. 
by truth. By truth. Those aligned with Satan preach a false gospel. We see there in, in even that text, with every wicked deception. So what do we know about Satan? He's the father of lies. He's going to lie. That's what he does. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus speaks truth. Our gospel is truth. And so those aligned with Satan will preach a false gospel. We're people who believe in the truth of Christ. So if people deny the gospel of Jesus, don't be awed by those miracles. I'm in a Facebook group of Arizona Southern Baptist pastors and ministers. One of our churches last Sunday or last weekend hosted a baptism. And the pastor told the story of a young lady who wanted to know God. But there was a lot more to that story. He mentioned how they had, I think the previous week, talked about demon possession in the Bible and said that was the case with this young lady. They said that they had prayed for her and this demon left through seizing. Her eyes rolled back. They gave a deep gospel presentation to this woman. They then asked, do you want to surrender to Jesus? And she said, yes. She became a new creation in Christ. She publicly confessed her faith and she was baptized. Now, I confess that normally my response or reaction, my first reaction, I guess, to something like that is skepticism. But should we not expect those things to happen today in a culture that often opens itself up to the demonic? Should we not expect demonic possession? And should we not expect that the power of God and the power of the gospel would come in such a way to drive out demons and bring about saving faith in Christ? I believe we can expect that to happen. So, fourth caution. Miracles on demand. There was a day, kids, if you're watching this, there was a day that we used to go to things called video stores. It used to be these places called Blockbuster where we'd go and we would rent a movie. You, you had to get in your car and physically drive somewhere and rent a movie to bring home. Now, they're right there at the touch of a button on our remotes. We want them, we get them, they're on demand. Now beware that we don't treat the sovereign God like he's on demand. I've heard some of those so-called faith healers speak to God in such a way that he exists to do their bidding. It's like he's the genie out of the bottle who must give them whatever they wish, that they demand, they order him around. And that is a horrific assault on the glory of God. He is the authority. We have no place, no right to demand things of God. But in His grace, He does allow us to come to Him and ask big things of Him. <coughs> this week I read the account of Timothy Paul Jones He's a Southern Seminary professor about his daughter, who is 23, who had contracted the COVID-19 virus, and it had put her in ICU. The family couldn't visit her. They, they wanted to, but the nurse said, actually, you don't want to be called in for a visit. If you're called in, it means the doctor doesn't think she's going to make it. She had to be sedated and placed on a ventilator. He prayed for his daughter's healing. In fact, he often prayed or repeated the prayer of Jairus from Mark 5, 23. My little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hand on her. Great prayer. Appropriate prayer. 
But he further added in Jesus' name. And here's what he said. These words are not a mere tagline we add to upgrade our our petitions to first class or to increase the likelihood that God will do exactly what we ask. To pray in the name of Jesus is to surrender our request to a plan that's greater than our own. When I pray in Jesus' name, I am asking God to do whatever will point most clearly to the glory and majesty of Jesus, even if that answer brings suffering and pain. Healing doesn't always take place in this life. Some healing will only happen in the life to come. But we don't trust in the healing itself. We trust in the healer. End of quote. You see, that's not approaching God like he is on demand. That is approaching God fully submitted to his will, that he is the sovereign and that whatever brings him the most glory, we want him to do. And we can come to him in submission, but also asking boldly for healing. And the good news for this family is that after three weeks in the hospital, In 11 days on a ventilator, their daughter came home. And I believe we can rest in the fact that God brings great glory to himself through that. So as we close, do we believe in miracles? Yes. Do we trust in God's sovereign will to bring them about as he sees fit? Yes. We can hope that every miracle that God does in the world today will bring someone to saving faith in Jesus. Because after all, that is the greatest miracle is when someone is transformed, when they're brought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought to the kingdom of light, when someone turns their allegiances from the self or from whatever else that they've been serving, they turn their allegiance and give it fully to Jesus Christ. That is the greatest miracle. And we should hope that happens often. Maybe you've seen in the last two months that Samaritan's Purse has set up an emergency field hospital in New York City near Central Park. And I think that is a great way for the Christian community to show compassionate care as the body of Christ. And honestly, I would much prefer Samaritan's Purse set up that hospital in Central Park And the supposed faith healer set up a tent and guarantee healings. Now, Samaritan's Purse treats people medically. And I believe that is a great thing that those doctors and nurses are skilled. They're educated in the medical field and they are treating people well. But I also am certain that it's okay for those doctors and nurses and those in that organization and for Christians to pray for healing for those patients, even miraculous healing. God can work in both ways. But here's a great thing. I've heard reports of patients going to that Samaritan's Purse emergency field hospital getting saved through the witness of that organization. That is the greatest miracle. So as we close, how do we apply this to our lives? Do I apply it by saying, hey, go and do a miracle today? Is that what you do? Is you, you, you who are listening there on your couches, get up, go do a miracle. No, I don't think that's the application that we take away. I think the application is pretty simple. Pray for big things from God. Pray. Pray boldly. But also trust in God's sovereignty. Submit everything to God's will. Pray bold prayers. Submit those bold prayers to the sovereign will of God. And take the gospel to people because we want people to be saved through the gospel proclamation and their lives be transformed. Let me pray with you. Father, I'm grateful for this text today. I pray, Lord, that we have unpacked it well and rightly to your honor and glory. Father, use your word to be at work in our lives. We pray for wisdom for us as a church in these coming days and weeks, that we would do what pleases you 
and what is in your perfect will. Father, we pray that you would work in this world in such a way as you see fit to bring glory to yourself and to see people trust in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that uh, we will be able to meet next week. We will try to keep you updated on the guidelines and the plan uh, as this week goes along. But we are going to be here. We plan on broadcasting for those who are not comfortable gathering yet. We want to do that as well. And, and we, are, we are grateful for all our folks, those who can join personally or, or, or in, in person, and those who feel more comfortable waiting a while. We affirm both decisions. And, uh, and, and you are a, a loved by the church at Tubac. So thank you for joining us again today.